You asked and Imperial listened. Due to extreme popularity and brewer demand, the A44 Kvyking blend is being released as a year-round available strain. This blend of three proprietary Kvyke strains absolutely loves hot fermentations, producing beers bursting with fruity notes of pineapple, guava, and tropical flavors. Use it for your summer Blondales, your hazy IPA, or anything else you want to have a delectable fruity fermentation character. And A44 is absolutely perfect for those who may not have the ability to precisely control fermentation temperatures. Just pitch your pouch and let her rip. Pick up your homebrew pouch where Wherever Imperial Yeast is sold and place commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. One of the keys to producing consistently good beer is to ensure good fermentation practices, which has many facets. Just like all living organisms, yeast are able to do their job of turning wort into tasty beer better when it has the proper nutrients, of which there are many. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And in this episode, I'm joined by contributor Cade Job to talk about a nutrient many view as being one of the most important for yeast, and that is zinc. Yeah, uh, we're going to talk about zinc today. I mean, obviously, yeast needs a lot of stuff in order to do its job, uh, you know, nutrients being a really important part of it. Uh, yeah, but we're going to focus on zinc today. I know we've done a, a yeast nutrients podcast before, so we're going to try not to overlap that, but really get in and talk about zinc and what it does and how uh, maybe it can improve your fermentations. Yeah, well, and in, in brewing, there are definitely a lot of things people recommend to improve beer quality uh, that are just kind of a pain in the butt to do or require a lot of clunky equipment. Uh, convoluted mashing methods, uh, even fermentation temperature control requires a bunch of stuff. But using a cheap product like zinc is about as easy as it gets. And if it has a uh, noticeable positive impact, why not? All right. Uh, If you're a fan of this show and you would like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Milk the Funk's Dan Pixley took questions this last weekend. It was incredible. And uh, coming up next month in August is Richard Priest from Ontario, Canada's Escarpment Labs. Richard and his crew have been offering various types of yeast from clean lager and ale strains to kvike and sour blends uh, to brewers for the last couple of years, during which they've really made an incredible name for themselves. If you want to be a part of this session, which let's be honest, who doesn't love talking and learning more about yeast, uh, be sure to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by August 14th, 2020. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Uh, And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review and Apple Podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. I just checked and we've surpassed the 700 review mark in Apple Podcast, which is pretty great for a show that's only been around for three years. Why don't you take the minute or two to help us get over a thousand reviews? We'd really appreciate that. All right. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high quality stainless fittings, at great prices with super fast shipping. Uh, learn more at brewershardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy when you're checking out to receive a free gift. Again, that's brewershardware.com. Listener Ed Marquette had some feedback on our last episode about cleaning and sanitation. This is some good stuff here, Cade. He said, uh, I agree 100% about not buying a plate chiller. (laughs) I've used one for about six years and have a ridiculous cleaning regimen. Uh, After the boil and filling of fermenters, I shoot water back and forth through the chiller five to six times until it comes out clear. I then hook everything back up in line to the boil kettle, which has already been rinsed out, and recirculate hot OxyClean for about 30 minutes, uh, switching the direction through the plate chiller a couple of times which leads to a large pile of gunk always gathering in the center of the boil kettle. After that, I rinse water back and forth through the plate chiller five to six more times, and additional gunk will come out that gets caught up in the corners. This whole process takes about 45 minutes, but to do less is risking crap still being trapped in the chiller. I then stand the plate chiller at a slight angle to get all of the water to drain out. It's a pain in the ass. I recommend people buy an immersion chiller from Jaded, which I can't do due to the DIY electric kettle I'm using. <laughs> oh, man. I, I love hearing about people's cleaning regimens, mostly just because <laughs> uh, mostly because I think a lot of people would be somewhat appalled at my cleaning regimens whenever I'm brewing just at home for my own consumption. But uh, but no, I, yeah, hey, I, I mean, I think that that's a good 
good process. I, I would say I think 30 minutes on OxyClean is probably more than you really need to if you're constantly recirculating through there. But hell, man, if that's working for you and you're uh, you're getting you're, you're getting gunk out of that plate chiller, that's what you need to do. I mean, that's always been my concern with plate chillers is how can you properly clean it? It sounds like even after running water through, you're then adding OxyClean and still getting more gunk out. I, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to see if we could actually take it apart and see how much is actually in there on the insides. Um, Ugh. but yeah. Have you ever used a plate chiller? Um, uh, well, I mean, we use a, a heat exchanger at the, at the brewery, which is a lot, which is very similar to a plate chiller, but right. no, I've never used one at home, man. I'll, I've already said my piece about plate chillers in that episode. And it sounds like I'm not the only one who loathes that particular piece of gear. <laughs> I know I, I, you said you can't use an immersion chiller because of your setup, Ed, but I, I'm telling you, there are other much easier to clean options out there, namely counterflow chillers that are more smooth on the inside. You don't have to worry about nooks and crannies and such. You might consider looking into something like that. At least that's what I would do. All right. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. Cade, I know that like me, you are a huge fan of Kolsch, which is such an approachable and easy drinking beer style. Well, listener Chris Brown, no, not that Chris Brown, is also a fan and brewed one up. Uh, he said was made with all German ingredients except for the gelatin fining uh, and treated otherwise in a fairly traditional manner. Uh, Chris sent me a few bottles of what he calls Appalachian Kolsch to share with my friends. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. A fool run fell in love. Dude, I'm so over that. A fool around and judged a beer horn. Timmy, what? We're going to do something we've never done before. All we're right. going to drink it all the way down. We're going to drop the glass on the table and we're going to say one or zero. One is yes, zero is no. You ready? Let's do it. Go! One. One. That was good. What is that? Mm. That is just good. It was very tasty. It was good. It was easy to drink. It was easy to pound. It was easy to. We did pound it. Just tell me, Timmy, 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 tell me, Joe. I don't know. I think it was some sort of lager. <sighs> it was good. Man, it was smooth, right? That was a good one. We don't want to be made to look like fools, but let's just guess like a, 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 a lager. I said that already, but it probably isn't because I'm always wrong. If you say lager, it sounds like something that people know but don't know. Uh, it's a lager. I think we nailed it. It's a lager. And from the, the zero to one, we gave it a one, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a seven. I'm, I'm gonna give it an eight. I would like to dedicate this song to that. A fool around and fell in love. I fooled around and fell in love. Well, Jersey fooled around and failed to rate this beer, but I'll tell you what, he loved it. So let's just say 10 jerseys. That sound good, Caden? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I mean, not like the points are arbitrary or anything anyway. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> he did love the beer. Uh, he, he was, you know, these sessions we tend to do, I've said this before, like eight to 12 beers in a session. I, I have a feeling Chris's was towards the end of our, our review session, but uh, the guys really did enjoy it. And I completely agree. Appalachian Kolsch was absolutely delicious. <laughs> I love I, I loved that review. Uh, the one uh, the one oh yes no thing was fun. <laughs> they left it binary, yeah, 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 binary. <laughs> yes, no, and I mean they were both like immediately yes. We liked it. Uh, so, I mean, hey, great, great job, Chris. I, you know, I, I've waxed poetic about my love for cultures before. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I love those beers. And it sounds like this is a really good one that they really liked. So, it, well, funny story. Uh, so Chris sent me three bottles of this beer and he had nice labels on them and all that uh, wrapped the top with um, electrical tape. So as soon as I got them, I opened one of the bottles and it was really good. Drank the whole thing. I even uh, sent a Facebook message to Chris saying, hey, man, got your beer and it's fantastic. He was really excited about it. Uh, we went at probably three or four weeks between then and the, uh, well, about a week out from the review session. So since I had two left, I figured I'd pop another one open and I did. And it was purple. It had that, uh, uh, you know, the, the oh, telltale wow. signs of oxidation. I know. And so I'm drinking it and I, I, I shoot Chris another message. I'm like, dude, I'm bummed out. Chris was bummed out naturally. Uh, and so I figured when, when we were doing the review session, you know, I'd save this final bottle, open it up and, you know, share it with the guys, but maybe not publish the review because who wants to have their, you know, accidentally oxidized, which happens when you bottle beer off the keg. Who wants to have yeah. that, you know, public? Well, I opened this beer and it was 
yellow, crystal clear, absolutely delicious. So something happened to that second bottle, and I'm so glad that's not the one that made it to the review session. Chris, thank you so much for sending uh, those bottles of Appalachian Kolsch in. They were absolutely delicious. Uh, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in, reviewed by Jersey and Tim on the show, you can email me, Marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. When we're back from this short break, we'll be shifting the focus to zinc. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at craftmastergrowlers.com. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. It wasn't long after I started brewing that I began to hear other brewers singing the praises of using yeast nutrients. Uh, eventually, I picked some up from the homebrew shop and noticed it contained a blend of all kinds of stuff, including today's focus, zinc. Now, before we get too deep into what exactly zinc is and how it affects beer, perhaps we should start by doing a brief overview of uh, yeast nutrients in general. Yeah, so most of our uh, listeners already know this, but yeast are actually living organisms, right? They're little tiny creatures. So that means that they need food, they need water, they need oxygen, they need vitamins, they need all these things that actual organisms, uh, you know, organisms need, just like you and I, Marshall. I mean, we need we need food and water and oxygen to survive. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I think people tend to just think of, of yeast sometimes as these little just tiny things that you put them in there, uh, put them in wort, and then they make alcohol and CO2. And that's kind of it, you know, and they go, okay, well, if I just pitch this into sugar, it's going to do its thing and, uh, and, and go about its business, which is true. I mean, yink, yeast will do that whenever it's in the presence of sugar and oxygen. And, uh, um, and then once the oxygen consumed, it can ferment and make alcohol. Right. Uh, but yeast actually needs things in order to perform better you know to change the actual ultimate character of the beer you can do things like giving yeast supplements that it needs so using things like nitrogen vitamins phosphorus magnesium and the point of today's episode zinc uh, you actually can help that yeast make uh, make itself better stronger more vital uh, produce better beer and then actually eliminate character uh, that you don't want, like esters or fusel alcohols or other things, uh, just by doing these simple nutrient additions. Yeah, and so that's the point, right? It's not necessarily, well, you know, ostensibly, zinc isn't necessarily being used to, 
on its own to contribute some flavor or to take some flavor away, what you're doing is really trying to amp up the health of those yeast so that they're ready to go and do the job that you want them to do in the best way possible. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, yeast, like I said, they need a certain amount of stuff in order to do things. And I'm using the word stuff uh, as kind of a, you know, a, a lame term for for uh, for all of the things that yeast needs. But I think it's very scientific it's stuff. You know, oh, you, you can't explain everything. So. Yeah, totally. I, I'm totally going to put that in a paper someday. There we go. Uh, uh, the yeast yeast stuff. Um, no, but, uh, you know, I mean, if we think about what wort is, wort is mostly a sugar water solution. So obviously yeast is going to take that sugar and convert it into alcohol but how they do it is what's really important and you know how yeast take up uh, uh, sugars and and oxygen and convert that into alcohol and co2 differs among the different species which is why we get the different products um, and why yeast flavors are different uh, you know so thinking about how they actually do that is important in uh, ultimately designing the character of the beer that you're producing. So, you know, we malt or at least all malt wort contains things that the yeast need in order to survive. So that's stuff like sugar, nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, um, all of these, uh, you know, other sorts of elements. Yeah, and that stuff is, I mean, a large uh, amount of that is it's a part of the wort naturally because it comes from the grains uh, and the water even that you're using um, to, to, to make that wort, right? I mean, that's, that's at least what I've heard. You, you get a lot of that stuff naturally from uh, the malt and the grains that are used. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's a plant, right? Malt is a plant. So it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of nitrogen in it. It's going to have trace minerals on its husk and on the, uh, you know, inside the seed and the endosperm and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, all malt wort, especially, and I'm sort of specifying all malt right now, uh, is definitely going to have, you know, uh, almost all of the things that you need, all, all of the things that the yeast needs in order to ferment um, and and uh, make alcohol and CO2. Right. You know, so obviously it's got sugar, it's got nitrogen, it's got phosphorus, magnesium, um, some of those other things. Uh, but uh, non-malt, so adjuncts like corn and rice and that stuff are different plants and don't have sort of uh, as much of those additional materials, those nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, those additional things, uh, because they're a different plant and have different structural uh, components and, and, and things that make up uh, their seed um, and their plant, their husk, yeah. um, and the things that finally get put into the word. Uh, so yeah, you know, all malt has a lot of the things, but there's two really important ingredients that are uh one of them's missing um from from malt or at least missing in in appreciable qualities and that's oxygen okay uh ox obviously oxygen's a, a a gas that has to get injected um into the wort in order for uh the yeast to take it up start their metabolism and then ultimately start fermentation right. later once oxygen's been used but the other one and the point of today's is zinc um zinc is not natural is it, can be present in very small amounts on all malt wort, but generally isn't present in uh, sufficient amounts that yeast would need in order to uh, ferment and and use CO2. Right. So the so the addition of yeast nutrients in general, which typically uh, contain a fair amount of zinc, is to bump up the what is naturally fairly low concentration of zinc that is naturally in uh, the, the grain or the wort, as it were, um, in order to benefit those yeast as they're fermenting. It's not it's not like we're again, I, I, I for some reason, I always think of additions uh, to to like like water chemistry as being a flavor component. The yeast nutrient part really is to uh, encourage that yeast to, to ferment as healthily as possible. Yeah. And like you said at the top, I mean, we'll keep hitting on this topic because I think it's real important. You know, adding zinc isn't necessarily adding a flavor component. I mean, I suppose it could if you added just a ton of zinc to it, you could change the change the beer. Uh, we'll talk later that you don't really need much zinc at all. In fact, it's called a trace mineral for yeah. a re or a trace metal for a reason. Uh, you only need small traces of it. Uh, but yeah, you know, adding the zinc itself is not like is not like adding hops to beer or adding uh you know like you said calcium sulfate or magnesium or, or uh, you know epsom salts or any of that stuff that will you know really change the flavor of the beer yeah because of their quantities this is about yeast health yeah yeah exactly and the, and i mean those are like referred to as flavor minerals or flavor salts or whatever and, and you're d using it to adjust uh the 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 lever the flavor and aroma levers and and such um, so, so, all right, before we really start digging into what zinc 
zinc is and and uh, how it's used and such. The, just real generally, there are some. I I don't want to say beliefs because we can kind of measure it and we we you know the 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 hard science has measured this before but there are some purported consequences of fermentation with low nutrients and there are some i mean many purported ve- benefits to uh, making sure that you have a proper level of nutrients what are some of the things that can happen outside of uh uh you know it, like we talked about it you're not adding a bunch of flavor stuff in there um what are some things that can happen if you have a poorly uh, or a, or a low amount of nutrients in wort when you pitch your yeast? Yeah, so this is a this is a great question, and it kind of uh, even segues into what zinc is and why it's used. But, uh, you know, to answer that succinctly, it's about health of the yeast, right? So if your yeast doesn't have the nutrients it needs in order to, uh, you know, grow, pr- reproduce, you know, ferment, uh, do its metabolic activities, it's going to result in, uh, you know, off flavors and off characteristics. So fusel alcohols are an example of sure. those are those like higher alcohols that taste hot and burn and give you a headache. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give you a headache. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the yeast will produce those if it doesn't have sufficient nutrients because it has to break things down in different ways. It has to work harder. Um, we'll say in order to get access to other minerals, uh, nutrients and things. And because it does that, it's like, you know, just like you do, uh, you know, Marshall, if you're working out at the gym, um, and you know, you've had a particularly tough workout, you're all hot and sweaty and you need to replenish, uh, you know, the water that's lost and maybe some salts and stuff that are lost, you know, drinking a Gatorade or something, uh, to help replenish that taking salt tabs. If you're a long distance runner, um, all that stuff binds together water and gets water back into your system quickly so that you can actually continue to function and not just fall down and, you know, uh, sick of like a heat stroke or something. Right. Same thing for yeast. You know, yeast is an organism. It needs that water. It needs that, um, oxygen. It needs, um, you know, nutrients, food, uh, to be able to consume that sugar and, and do its job. So yeah, you know, uh, like I said, fusel alcohols is one, uh, depending on where in the fermentation you are, esters, uh, can also be one, uh, that, that results from unhealthy, uh, unhealthy yeast. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh yeah, uh, just a plethora of things. I probably couldn't list them all here on the podcast. <laughs> well, and those are, those are, co- those are like, uh, uh, you know, downstream, uh, issues with poor fermentation. I mean, I'm, when I think about, uh, yeast nutrient, I think about the impact it can have on things like, um, attenuation and, you know, the, oh, yeah. the flocculation too. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Right. The, those, those, uh, more observable, almost characteristics. Um, and by observable, I mean, you get to see fermentation activity and measure it with a hydrometer. Um, when I think of poor health, yeast health, um, my biggest concern is uh, the initially, like primarily, is the ability for that yeast to do what I want it to do, which is to ferment to a specific level, uh, to attenuate to a point where I want that beer. And if it doesn't, uh, then there can be those, like I said, those downstream consequences of undesirable esters, off flavors, fusel alcohol, stuff like that. And that to me is the reason I... I so, and again, I've got my own thoughts on actually adding outside, you know, external nutrient uh, to the wort. But to me, I want to make sure at least that, that the nutrients are there enough in whatever capacity uh, so that, that that yeast performs the way I want it to perform. Now, when we think about zinc specifically, I, I guess, what exactly is zinc anyways? I mean, I it's it, it, when I hear zinc, I think metal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, zinc is a metal. Uh, that, that's at its, you know, at its basic elemental form, zinc is a metal. Uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of fermentation, uh, we'll refer to it as a trace metal. Um, a trace metal because it's, it's only needed in very, very small quantities. Uh, but what it does, it's actually... Uh, to me, it's really fascinating. It does several things, but one of the biggest thing is, is it's actually a cofactor for enzymatic reactions. Uh, so enzymes are what make things happen um, in yeast. So, for example, one of the uh, primary enzymes is alcohol dehydrogenase, and that alcohol dehydrogenase is what is a part of the process that produces alcohol, right? One of the primary functions of yeast. Zinc provides the structural site, which is the, uh, the place where alcohol dehydrogenase can actually work uh, and, and produce alcohol. So it's a cofactor because it allows the enzyme to actually do its job. It huh. provides a place, uh, sets up the site where alcohol dehydrogenase can go ahead and, um, uh, and uh, uh, do its thing. 
Uh, you know, so if you think about it, if you don't have uh, zinc or if you don't have enough, where's alcohol dehydrogenase going to going to do its job? Uh, you know, that's a there, there are other places that it can just a caveat. We're not going to get into that too much today. But I mean, if you have zinc, you've given it a, a place like like uh, I'll use the gym example again. If you have a gym that's set up with all of the equipment that Marshall needs in order to work out, <laughs> Marshall can go to the gym and work out. Right. And Marshall's happy and he and uh, his wife is happy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so so we have you know, we have it. If there is no gym, then Marshall's got to work out at home or, or whatever and may not have access to everything he needs may not be able to do workouts or maybe just stop um and uh, <laughs> uh you know do something else and get uh, fatter you know, than i, I mean, already am i thanks a lot Kate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no but i mean it, like that's a very I, I think that's a very visceral way to think about what zinc does in a very meaningful way yeah know? And on a very molecular level, I mean, you, that, that is when I, so I did a little bit of research on the zinc thing, you know, I'm not, I'm not that lazy not to look into this a little bit more. And what I thought, one of the more interesting, um, uh, ideas, uh, that I read about when it comes to adding zinc specifically as a nutrient, uh, during fermentation, um, it's this idea that, that like, so we all, I mean, I very rarely make yeast starters anymore these days. Thank you, Imperial yeast. Uh, but, but you know, a lot of people are, are pitching yeast starters to prop up, to propagate their cell count. But even in doing that, there's, there's still not enough yeast cells, uh, uh, to ferment that entire batch of wort. You still, once you pitch that yeast starter, what you've done is you've increased the viability so that they don't have to work so hard in the initial, uh, propagation phase, uh, uh that, that reproduction phase, once it hits the actual full batch of wort, right? So this means those yeast need to reproduce more to make enough cells to adequately get the job done. Well, this is one of the main things that I read, at least, that zinc is used for, though in addition to promoting uh, cell growth, it's also, I guess it's known to improve the yeast's ability meta to metabolize uh, both maltose and maltotriose during active fermentation. Obviously, the two, the two sugars we want metabolized during fermentation, uh, primarily. Um, and then finally, because of its effect on yeast growth and activity, it's believed to reduce, and this is a, this is a big one for me, I didn't, I didn't know this until I was researching zinc for this show, um, it, it reduces the chance of hydrogen uh, sulfide, which I believe is HS2, being present in the finished beer. If, if For those of you who don't know what hydrogen sulfide is in name, uh, if you've ever opened up your fermentation chamber after pitching a lager yeast and it smells like egg farts, that's hydrogen sulfide. Am I, is that right, Kate? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, uh, that's totally right. I mean, we talk about it, uh, you know, in the brewery, we talk about viability and vitality um, when we're talking about yeast. So viability, uh, you know, meaning you know, more or less the quantity of cell cells that you have having a, a sufficient number and then vitality uh, that the yeast are actually healthy and are going to ferment. You right. know, I mean, I could have thousands and thousands of dead yeast cells and get no fermentation. So we talk about both and zinc helps in both ways, right? Viability in terms of reproduction, um, helping the yeast reproduce and vitality. Uh, so one of the other things it'll do is actually help the membrane of the yeast cell. Um, so it, it helps uh, the membrane develop the membrane so that the membrane can regulate what goes into and out of the cell so right. that the cell can get other nutrients that it needs. So yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. All of those things um, result in healthier yeast, more consistent per, you know, fermentations, even sometimes shorter fermentations if yeast is healthy enough. And like you said, reduction of that sulfur character uh, as we go down. That's something that we've struggled with a lot uh, with sour beers uh, in the brewery because at that low pH, those yeasts are in really hostile conditions. They don't like to be, uh, you know, in that in that condition. So what we want to do as part of the brewery is give them sufficient nutrients so that they, even if they're in hostile conditions, they still have all of the things that they need to to survive. So right. we do a nutrient addition. We do a nutrient addition in the boil and in the fermenter so that we can give the yeast enough uh, enough nutrients. And then that does include a large proportion of zinc in the the nutrient addition that we use. Hmm. So yeah. I mean, these are these are real world applications, uh, you know, that 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 uh, this zinc is important in fermentation. And like you said earlier, the hard science backs it up. I mean, you can check the amount of zinc in cells 
um, once you've taken the yeast pitch out, you can actually do some tests and, and it'll tell you how much zinc is in the cells and how much the cell actually needs, whether you had enough zinc or whether the cells had a healthy fermentation um, or whether they didn't. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and I'm not arguing that. I, I think the, you know, what we tend to focus on at Brewlosophy is the sensory side of things. And I think it's interesting to see, you know, if it has a, a perceptible impact. So when it comes to using zinc in uh, the brewery, there are, it comes in various forms. I've never actually purchased uh, zinc, raw zinc as it were, or whatever uh, to use that way. But I do, like I mentioned, I do have, uh, I think it's like the Y yeast, yeast nutrient blend, and it definitely has zinc in it. So that's one way to get it. If somebody wanted to add just straight zinc uh, does it come in various forms is it, it can you buy it just like at a health food store it's is it one of those things or what Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, it, it definitely it can come in different forms. Uh, the most common that's used in the brewing industry is what's called zinc sulfate or zinc sulfate heptahydrate. That's where you'll find from like more beer or BSG if you're buying from those places. Uh, that's the form that it'll come in. But it also comes in an HEB supplement or HEB. Sorry, is a grocery store in Texas, a grocery <laughs> store supplement, uh, you know, zinc gluconate, which is the zinc tablets that you can go and buy from the grocery store pretty much anywhere or health food stores. Uh, so so it comes in those in, in a bunch of different forms. But something interesting, too, that, that you kind of bring up um, in the form that you can add zinc um, is uh, this question of whether zinc is actually missing uh, from the fermentation. You know, do we even need to add the zinc uh, in the first place, which I think is kind of interesting. And one of the reasons I raise this is because, sure, you know, malt... Uh, itself probably doesn't have enough zinc but we have other things in uh, like water if you're using tap water yeah there may be zinc in there and one of the fascinating things for me is that you can actually get sufficient zinc by having a plate like a like a just a disc of zinc or even some breweries in germany um i i read about this i don't obviously have any personal experience we'll have these like chains that are made of zinc that they'll have in the mash tun um, and they, they use those chains in order to like, you know, spin around in the mash. And there's actually enough zinc that comes off of those chains or that plate that gets into the wort that provides a sufficient amount of yink of zinc um, that the yeast needs to ferment, which I just think is this like fascinating way to get around Ron and, and I think <laughs> the ingenuity of people is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Wait, next, <laughs> next zinc experiment, just toss a couple of zinc coated nails in the uh, boil kettle, I suppose, and <laughs> see how that goes. Yeah. I was actually thinking about that. In fact, you know, is it that simple? And, you know, again, zinc is just an element, uh, you know, uh, I believe it's, I believe the elemental, uh, symbol is ZN and it's like uh, 30 or something like that on the periodic table. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, it is just an element. So I've, I mean, if it's that simple, maybe you could just toss a couple nails in. I was going to make a joke about that until you said that some Germans are using chains, you know, zinc coated <laughs> chains. So maybe it would work. Right, right. 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 Maybe, maybe it would. I mean, there's all these people that, are, that you know, that are talking about it. And, uh, and you know, I, it, before we get into like sort of, you know, dosage rates and stuff and how much we actually need, you know, there, it also depends on how you're pitching your yeast. So, you know, if you're using a fresh pitch from a yeast manufacturer, almost all the manufacturers will have an ingredient on the, the yeast packet. It's not just yeast that you're getting. It's also a nutrient solution that the yeast is in. And yep. that's because the yeast, who knows, you know, needs nutrients in order to hibernate and because they want that yeast to have access to nutrients as soon as it's pitched into wort. Uh, so like, for example, Imperial Yeast has autolyzed yeast. Um, White Labs um, says that they have, you know, uh, trace minerals on their packages and stuff. So, uh, you know, most of the fresh pitches that you're going to see from the manufacturer likely contain enough zinc that you not, don't necessarily need to add it. But if you're repitching yeast or if you're harvesting yeast, uh, then yeah, you, there's, you're going to reach a point where you're going to have used up all of the zinc that came with the yeast and you're going to need to add zinc to it. Uh, you know, it, zinc is taken up and used during fermentation. So, you know, something to be thinking about if you're harvesting and repitching yeast, right. that's actually an opportunity where zinc can become very important to your yeah. fermentation. Um, you know, yeah, so. that's what I read is that is that for people who are and I think there was a comment about this we may end up getting to later, but that for people who are constantly harvesting and repitching yeast, which fantastic way if you're if you're a clean freak like us, you know, a fantastic way to save some cash on on yeast. Uh, one of the things you 
you have to keep in mind is that uh, as you reuse that yeast, uh, what you're propagating it up, and if you are indeed propagating it up, uh, is it providing those minerals that the yeast needs to remain healthy and to continue fermenting uh, in, in, a, in a healthy way? So, uh, and I think that's, you know, when it comes to zinc specifically, that's what I've read really is where it counts, you know, is, is in these multi-pitch uh, uh, you know, pitches of yeast. Yeah, there was actually a really cool study that the MBAA, uh, I think his name is Joe Kinney. Um, I think that's right. If that's not right, then just email me with feedback. But uh, he did a presentation a few years back at the MBAA conference where he actually did first, uh, uh, like a fresh pitch and then first and second generation uh, lager fermentations and grafted out and everything. Um, and if I recall correctly, it did uh, ferment quicker. Um, fermentation was more vigorous and healthy. Um, when zinc additions were made in, you know, the first and second generations, but everything was pretty much equal yeah, uh, or agnostic of the zinc additions in the fresh pitch batch. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's a, you know, some more evidence that, that this zinc thing actually, actually, um, actually does something and is actually important. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I believe it's important. And so, so, you know, I guess if, if we haven't touched on it yet, uh, it, just real simply, how, how do you, I've never used zinc. I'm going to, I'll admit that, but I have used yeast nutrients with zinc. Um, where do you typically add the zinc? Is it one of those things you toss into the boil? Do you, do you make a solution, uh, with, with wort and then add it to the, to the fermenter? I mean, how, how do you use this stuff? Yeah, so there's there's uh, kind of some conflicting recommendations on this, but not necessarily. Uh, you know, like uh, the uh, Zanishev and Chris White, Jamil Zanishev and Chris White in the yeast book talk about adding zinc to the boil uh, or during whirlp whirlpool. Uh, the issue with that is there's also some evidence that it can get stuck in trube and not make oh, yeah. it to the fermenter. Uh, so, but you know, I mean, they, they obviously understood that. So they just said, okay, we'll just add some more zinc and you'll see why they say just add more zinc because you really need so little of it that even at a, at an industrial brewery scale, uh, you know, you're, it's, it's not very much, uh, additional zinc that you need. So yeah, you can add it in the whirlpool or the boil. Just be, just understand that. Yeah, it's going to get stuck in. There's going to be some that gets stuck in trube or it gets left in the boil kettle. So if you're adding the appropriate amount, you know, or the total amount that you need to in the fermenter to the boil kettle, you're just going to need to reduce it. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or sorry, add more so that you get the amount in for fermenter because right. That's where it needs to be is in the fermenter right before you pitch the yeast because then the yeast is going to take it up and use it in its reproduction and metabolism and then um, have a happy, wonderful fermentation. So <laughs> the the other method. So like I said, at the brewery, we do it two ways. We add yeast nutrient, which is zinc yeast nutrients, not a direct um, zinc salt, but uh, uh, it's a, uh, a nutrient that has zinc in it. Um, we add that in the whirlpool and then we do a second batch a couple of days into fermentation. Okay. Um, we do that for different reasons because like I said, we're doing sour beer and we have sort of a hostile environment. We want to make sure that they continue to have sufficient, um, zinc as they're doing it in a couple of days. Uh, but you can add it before you even yeast pitch, uh, or before you even pitch the yeast. So hmm. you've got the wort, the chilled wort racked over to your fermenter. You're about to pitch your yeast. You can make up a little solution of the salt, or you can even direct add the salt and just mix it up in the wort. Uh, and then, um, you know, as long as it's soluble, uh, mix it up in the wort, uh, and then pitch your yeast directly on that. Uh, yeah. so it's super easy to use, or, Hey, you know, if you've got a zinc, uh, a couple of zinc nails or zinc chains, just throw those in the fermenter <laughs> too. And you might be good to go. Um, yeah, hey, give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it sounds like blue owl takes uh, zinc very seriously. I would imagine, um, most breweries who are very concerned with, uh, making sure that th these humongous batches of beer don't go to waste, uh, would, would, there's no reason not not to focus on the nutrient levels and in particular zinc uh, so that fermentation goes off without a hitch. Are there any potential downsides to using too much zinc? I mean, again, I think of metal. So, uh, you know, a metallic off flavor, maybe I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm throwing this out there, but it, it, if you, you, is it too difficult to use too much uh, zinc? <laughs> uh, it's incredibly easy to use too much zinc. Uh, so for example, the dosage rates of zinc are really really low so you're you're looking at anywhere from like 0.1 parts per million to two parts per million hmm. so in a five gallon batch that means you need two to three milligrams of 
yeast in a five gallon or sorry two two on the low end up to as much as 40 milligrams but that's milligrams that's a tiny 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 amount uh, uh, of yeast so uh you know as an example on a 30 barrel batch which is what we do in the brewery we use 33 grams or uh you know for the whirlpool edition and then we use 17 grams uh in the fermenter that's 17 grams that's nothing <laughs> that is nothing that, that's that's basically a half an ounce in in yeah and that's in a 30 barrel batch Jesus. all right that's yeah. you know that's what i you know 30 gallons in a in a barrel times 30 you know do the math and you can figure out exactly how many the five gallon batches that is uh you know but uh, yeah, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount that you need. So you can absolutely add more zinc than is necessary. Yeah. Um, and there's some research out there that has said, yeah, too much zinc can inhibit fermentation. Hmm. If you have too much zinc, then the zinc is binding with other things and uh, causing, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, chaos, you know, um, and the yeast isn't able to take in everything. Yeast, uh, the yeast can also take in too much zinc as well. And yeah. then they don't have space for other nutrients that, that would also help with fermentation too. So yeah, adding too much zinc can slow fermentation, can cause fermentation to lag, can produce additional off flavors, all of those things can reduce attenuation, you know, can reduce flocculation, all that kind of stuff. So yes, there are purported downsides uh, for adding too much zinc. So don't overdo it. I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I picked up some yeast nutrient uh, that included zinc uh, from the homebrew shop a while back, but it wasn't for beer, actually. I, uh, I, it was for hard cider. And, you know, I, I guess at the time I hadn't really felt that the use of nutrients uh, were for me at least in beer were needed uh, because I never had an issue that I would associate with a lack of nutrients. Again, I do. I'm a big fan of making sure that 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 wort has enough nutrients. I just I'm also a believer that um, the, the malt and other ingredients will provide most of those nutrients. And and I haven't had an issue. But uh, when when pitching yeast into apple juice and usually it was dry yeast for me, that bell stays on. I was consistently having lag times over 48 hours. So I'd sprinkle the yeast on just this store bought apple juice and it would take take two days uh, before I saw any signs of fermentation happening. And then, and then it would kick off and, and you know, I made good, really good hard cider that way, but I don't like that lag. And so I was complaining about this one time in the Brewlosophy uh, chat group and uh, Jake Houlihan recommended that I pick up this yeast nutrient and try adding that. And my word, uh, I've used it in my hard cider ever since, literally reduced that lag from two days to about 12 hours. And that to me speaks volumes, right? About the impact. Now that's not just zinc. Uh, you know, again, t just to be clear, that was a nutrient blend. Uh, it had a bunch of stuff in it, including zinc. So I, I can't speak specifically to the impact it had. Uh, plus, I, again, I only use it for cider. However, Cade, you recently performed an experiment that more clearly illuminates the effect zinc has on beer. We're going to discuss those those results when we return from this break. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. 
Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. Attention beer drinkers and thinkers. Put that mash paddle down for a second. Let me ask you, do you like to cook outside? Do you love the smell of charcoal and barbecue? If you've answered yes to any of those questions, I think you should check out the Grill Coach podcast, where we discuss all things barbecue and grilling. Join us on our mission where we aim to learn, teach, and share the amazing world of grilling and barbecue. So grab a homebrew and join us. We think you'll find our perspective on the world of outdoor cooking unique. You can find us online at thegrillcoach.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Instagram at the Grill Coach. From this home brewer to you, get out there and grill. Family owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus, Atlantic Brew Supply has an on site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. If I'm being completely frank, when I hear the word zinc, the first image that comes to mind is one of those old (laughs) metal trash cans. And yes, I may not be a senior yet, but I'm definitely old enough to remember taking the trash out before the city began providing those those pretty colored bins to separate your trash into. I think it's interesting that the same stuff used to prolong the life of things like metal bins and screws is also used by brewers to improve fermentation. Cade, you were interested to see for yourself how zinc impacts beer and you tested it out. Yeah, this one, uh, the the recipe and design for this experiment was pretty simple because I didn't want to do, uh, you know, I didn't want to do too much. I wanted the variable to shine a little bit, but, you know, I wanted to uh, kind of uh, create a little bit of a harsh condition uh, for the yeast to be in. I mean, I didn't do a sour beer on this one, but decided doing like a Hellesbach, a high OG Hellesbach um, would do a little bit more to stress out the yeast and hopefully exacerbate that need um, for, uh, you know, for uh, uh, zinc uh, to help with fermentation. So right. did a, uh, a 10 gallon batch of Hellas Bach. Uh, the, the malt uh, bill was super simple. 92% Pilsner. Um, actually, I think it was 98% Pilsner and 2% honey malt. Uh, so just a really simple, really simple malt bill. Uh, mashed at 144 um, uh, F or 62 C for 60 minutes. Uh, then I boiled for 60 minutes. Added... 14 grams of magnum at six at 60 minutes and then 14 grams of tetanang at five minutes again just a low hop dose uh didn't want to overpower anything mm-hmm. um after the boil chilled the worts using uh my uh, immersion chiller and then took a uh, gravity reading which showed that gravity was at 1.070 so a zinger nice, boy that's a big uh, one yeah <laughs> yeah, nice big beer. Yeah. Uh, exactly what I wanted to get. So uh, next was sort of similar. I'd split the wort into two uh, SS brew buckets and uh, set them into my uh, fermentation chamber to crash overnight so that they could get down to pitching temperature. Um, and then the next morning, got everything ready for introducing the variable, the zinc. So um, we had talked a little bit earlier about the range of zinc addition. So 0.2 up to 2 ppm. Uh, and I wanted to go sort of on the higher end because uh, there are uh, there, there's some research out there that says that, uh, you know, up to two ppm of zinc can actually improve foam retention mm-hmm. um, and, and stability. So I wanted to go up on the higher end uh, and uh, see if this zinc thing would actually do anything <laughs> uh, to, uh, you know, to to uh, to to the yeast. Um now the the zinc that I used was zinc uh, gluconate, which at the time I calculated was fourteen point three percent elemental zinc. So the real uh, zinc that I needed to get in is the elemental version, not like the other uh, uh, things that they use to bind it together into a powder. Uh, the zinc tablets were fifty milligrams each, or or um, and so there was seven point one five milligrams of zinc per tablet. Uh, so I used five point five tablets to get forty milligrams of pure elemental zinc. Um, however, 
uh, a, a commenter pointed out, we may get to this comment later, that is uh, using an incorrect calculation for the amount of elemental zinc that was in there. So I actually added 14 parts per million of zinc uh, instead of two <laughs> parts per million of zinc. Still still an experiment, but uh, yeah, maybe a <laughs> yeah, little bit higher yeah. than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be fun to see uh, the results of this because it added a lot of part, a lot of zinc to this. But <laughs> Um, so added the zinc and then pitched the yeast, uh, and it was uh, Imperial Yeast's L17 Harvest, which is my favorite Imperial yeast. Love it. Uh, love that stuff. Uh, fermented at 54F, um, and this is where I sort of noticed a difference um, in the, the beers. So the beer with zinc took a little bit longer to show active signs of fermentation than the beer without zinc. I find that interesting. That is that is really interesting, and it may, you know after talking about so again you, you you first off this was a lager that you were fermenting cool fifty four f which is twelve degrees Celsius so you've got you've got the cooler fermentation which we all know is slightly more stressful on yeast um, and you did pitch just a single pouch of imperial yeast I don't did you did you split a starter or did you yeah you did you made a starter on this one so you were doing everything right on this. Um, you know, the expectation based on what we talked about before is that the beer fermented with zinc or that the zinc addition should improve fermentation, uh, which would mean reduced lag, maybe more vigorous fermentation and a quicker finish. But that wasn't the case, uh, at least observationally, but, but in this experiment, uh, it was the opposite. The one without the zinc did better, it, which a- after talking about the potential uh, overdosage <laughs> that you did, perhaps it did have an, an effect just in the opposite direction expected because it was zinc drunk, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so uh, the, so I remember whenever I, I saw this, I was, I was thinking that the zinc beer took so much longer. And I was, you know, at, at that point, I'm thinking, hey, this is different than what everybody suggested would be the result of zinc. It <laughs> yeah. should be going faster. So, uh-oh, what's wrong? And, uh, you know, ultimately we figured out what was wrong, um, the, that I over overdid the zinc. Uh, but yeah, I you know, I, I think that that could be the reason why we ta- saw the zinc take longer. It just inhibited that, that growth uh, phase for the zinc or for the yeast. And so that's what took it a little bit longer. Well, but- and, and, well and that's the thing, though, is, is in doing that, we might still expect to see a flavor difference again, as, as a byproduct almost of uh, not, not the zinc addition, but the impact that that overdosage of zinc had on the yeast could potentially, uh, you know, encourage the development of esters or phenols or, or fusel alcohols that are unwanted because of the additional stress on the yeast. So I still think it's a very interesting experiment. Yeah, no, totally. Exactly. Uh, you, you hit the nail on the head of exactly what I was about to say, too. You know, uh, I mean, th- that... Uh, the addition of the additional zinc, uh, you know, should have inhibited fermentation. So we should see uh, different characters. Now, uh, we wanted to, uh, uh, so everything else uh, was sort of a standard uh, lager fermentation process. I raised the temperature to 66F or 19C after seven days um, and then left the beers alone for another 10 days before uh, taking final gravity measurements. And both of the beers actually hit the same final gravity, which was 1.010. Uh, yeah, that's a big attenuation for that beer. Uh, you know, they both hit the same final gravity. So even if, uh, the fermentation took longer and even if there was a bigger zinc dosage, uh, it doesn't appear that it had any objective measurable difference, at least in terms of, uh, final gravity at this point, which I also found interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if I'm checking boxes for a negative impact of, uh, you know, due to something like over <laughs> saturating zinc in, uh, on yeast, at least, uh, one of the things on my checklist is attenuation. And the fact that these both attenuated to the same, uh, final gravity, same exact final gravity, it would be a check mark for, okay, maybe things aren't going to be bad. But then again, it could be that it, it didn't impact attenuation so much as it did, uh, you know, flavor development uh, of other things we don't want in that beer. So, uh, well, so you did this and you're a cold crasher. So you, I believe you ended up cold crashing these beers, right? Yeah. I cold crashed them to 38 F or three C and left them overnight. Um, and then, uh, pressure transferred them into CO2 purge kegs, uh, as part of my normal process. Then I uh, burst carbonated them in the keyser and allowed them to condition another two weeks before being served to participants. So this one actually got participants. <laughs> yeah, it was pre-COVID. Woo! Um, Yay! <laughs> I might miss those old times. So so <laughs> before we talk about the actual uh, uh, experiment results, the beers to me, I'm you know looking at them on the website, and there are pictures in this in this experiment article, which if you click the link in the description of this episode, you can go 
read. Um, they look, I mean, the lighting is a little different. It looks very pretty out where you took the photo, but the, the beers look for the most part identical to my eyes. I, you know, may, maybe you saw something different uh, up close and personal, but yeah, I didn't notice any differences in the beer. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, they, it is definitely the lighting. Um, that's my backyard. Um, so that's <laughs> the sun was just on, on one side of the beers, which is, you know, is what it is but yeah no both of the beers looked identical they were a little hazier than i expected i did expect them to drop clear um i didn't use any finings on this batch um uh for no reason other than I just didn't. Well, no, I mean, I'm glad you didn't because I think um, one of the things about yeast nutrients is that it can have an impact on flocculation and beer, ultimately beer clarity. So to see if, you know, I'm glad you didn't find it because we would have missed out on that observation in this. Yeah, yeah, good point. In, it, right. And in, 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 in this experiment, it would seem like the over addition of zinc, at least, didn't have any appreciable impact on that aspect of things because both both beers, again, look similar. Now, you had mentioned earlier something about an uh, impacting foam retention. Um, nothing in, in the way of that that you noticed? Did they? I mean, the, the head looked the same on both? Yeah, no, the head looked the same on both. Uh, the picture uh, has one with a little bit bigger head than the other one on the website, but that's just because one was poured before the other sure. one. Yeah, uh, yeah, the head retention and the uh, stand on those was both was really good on both. No issues on either of them. Right on. And then you did your own series of triangle tests. Uh, how'd you do on those? Yeah, well, I so I expected to taste at least a mouthfeel. Uh, difference because of flocculation and that other stuff, but I uh, I got zero out of uh, four four attempts. Man, so a big you old suck, goose man. egg. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's so funny. I like I, I love this too. I I love the triangle test because you know oh yeah oh I'm a cicerone and I'm a certified BJCP judge and I still got zero out of four <laughs> attempts. Right. Well, like, I yeah. mean, yeah, and you knew <laughs> what the variable was. So right off the bat, you're like, why the hell am I not able to pick this out? Even though I know exactly <laughs> what's going on, which which says it speaks to your triangle test administration. Uh, to yourself uh, <laughs> technique because honestly yeah. it's so easy for us it, that's just the way we are we're biased to want to be right and I get that it's so it's easy for us to you know mark the bottoms of cups and, and you know mix them up but kind of know which one is which and, and we don't do it intentionally but the fact that you got zero out of four to me really says that even somebody who brewed the beers knows exactly what the variable is knows exactly what to expect from from the impact of that variable couldn't distinguish the odd beer out out of four triangle test attempts. I don't know, man. It's kind of eking to me that, hey, this may not have had much of an impact, even though you overdosed, potentially overdosed uh, the, the zinc by, by a factor of many. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we have to serve it to tasters. So, uh, you know, so we we uh, I had f uh, 15 uh, participants in this experiment. Uh, I would have needed nine in order to reach statistical significance, uh, but only four were actually able to tell the beer apart. So, uh, twenty-seven percent. Uh, and so that was not uh, not uh, significant. Tasters were not able to tell the the beers apart. Yeah, and and say what you want about sensory analysis and triangle tests and how terrible brewlosophy is. Four out of fifteen people were able to tell these beers apart. Come on, I mean that 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 says that these beers were very, very, very likely tasted uh, different. They tasted the same. Um, it, yeah. Which we talked a little earlier about, you know, you've got mineral salts you've or flavor salts, flavor minerals that we add gypsum and which is, you know, calcium sulfate. You've, you've got calcium chloride, which we know rounds out flavors and, and uh, you know, brings up, amplifies that malt character. We have tested over and over and over again. When you add those, when you do something different with those flavor minerals, it does seem to have a perceptible impact. People can use usually taste the impact of those minerals. The fact that adding zinc in it, in it, and I think this is just interesting because of those prior experiences and experiments, the fact that adding zinc, which is just another mineral, um, well, an element, we should say, uh, in the amount that you did, in the proportion that you did, didn't even affect... Uh, uh, or, or have some sort of a noticeable impact. That part is really interesting to me, you know, suspending the whole impact it should have on the yeast um, for fermentation. The fact that it didn't taste different really does surprise me because I was expecting more of metallic flavor maybe in the zinc beer or something different, but no. And that, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, especially, you know, I mean, this was a, you know, it was a starter based on a fresh pitch of imperial yeast, you know, so, but it was a starter. Uh, and so uh, it wasn't a, a first generation or second generation pitch. So there could have been sufficient zinc in the, uh, in the uh, one that didn't get the 14 parts per million right. uh, zinc addition. So, you know, 
uh, this, you know, the results are interesting. I think, I think, uh, you know, set out to, to show that whether or to figure out whether zinc would have a difference or not. Yeah. We added way more zinc than necessary. And still the beers came out, uh, you know, in, uh, not significant. People weren't able to tell the beers apart. Yeah. So I think that is, that it, that does show that at least in this case, uh, at least in a first pitch, even if it was a starter, and then adding way more zinc than is necessary, mm-hmm. it's still you, p- tasters still weren't able to uh, reliably tell these beers apart, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, that that to me shows me okay, if I'm doing first pitches, uh, maybe I don't need to add uh, zinc to it. Uh, if I'm doing a first pitch from a starter, maybe I don't need to add zinc to it. And right. if I accidentally, you know heavy hand to the zinc edition, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know, I don't have to worry that it's going to result in spoiling the beer, at least at the, 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 uh, you know, concentration that I added it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And again, just to qualify it, because we got to say this a million times every episode, this was one experiment. This was one set of tasters. Uh, we're not saying that zinc doesn't have an impact. We're just saying that in this particular experiment, fascinatingly, it didn't seem to impact the the sensory side of the beer uh, in any way. And it, and it, oddly enough, seemed to have a detrimental or not detrimental, but it, it reduced the, uh, the yeast vigor uh, when it comes to uh, starting fermentation. So very interesting. Again, one of the thoughts I had is that imperial yeast probably i mean almost certainly is using yeast nutrients in their uh propagation media so the the wort or whatever it is that they use to grow their yeast i'm i would imagine has plenty of nutrients in it and it's possible that that there's enough zinc in there uh to cover it and that once you get to a certain point it just doesn't matter um so so maybe that's what happened but regardless um i I, i'm going to I'm not going to be picking up zinc, at least on its own, anytime soon to use in my beer. So uh, I, not that these experiments had a huge shift in my thinking because I wasn't doing that anyways. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think I wrote in the article and I, I still feel this way. I, you know, I, I would like to see a couple of more experiments done on this before I'm willing to commit one way or the other sure. about, yeah. you know, adding adding zinc. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, this this, you know does make me think at least for a first pitch if you're using imperial yeast and doing a first pitch that zinc may not be all that necessary yeah. um, uh, you know for for the yeast edition and that's right in line with what we've read and in, in terms of the hard science of it too you yeah. know uh yeah so yeah I, i'm comfortable saying that i'm not comfortable saying zinc doesn't have a part to play because i think it does just at later of later course times. of course well uh this experiment did yield some really interesting and detailed uh comments so i'm going to go through just a few of them uh, if we address some of this stuff earlier then we'll just readdress it again uh, all right simon hall said i've tried adding zinc to starters a couple of times but never to the actual wort for my brews i wonder if the lack of a difference between the beers was down to the fresh imperial yeast you used okay um, i imagine yeast manufacturers are growing their yeast up in ideal conditions with plenty of yeast and uh, I had heard the additional zinc is really only necessary after multiple repitching when the lack of nutrient might be more apparent yes we did kind of talk about this a little bit uh, earlier on in the episode yeah and this is why I love our readers because we didn't talk about this in the article right Uh, this wasn't mentioned in the article we talked about it in the podcast because it's interesting and we get to go into a little bit more detail right Uh, but I love our readers because they pick up on this kind of information and uh, they're so smart and uh, about what they've what they've read uh, and really understand the the details and issues. So, so yeah, that's a great comment. I think that's what we've talked about on the podcast and. Uh, uh, yeah, great comment, Simon. Well, yeah, and if I'm if I was I don't really harvest much yeast anymore these days because I'm I'm brewing so many different styles and um, just I'm not brewing as often as I used to. I don't want that yeast sitting around. But if I were constantly harvesting yeast, particularly going cone to cone, so you're taking it from one batch. I mean, cone to cone is kind of a proverb. Uh, 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 what do they call that? Uh, 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 colloquialism. Uh, and and so uh, you know if I'm doing that over and over and not not repropagating that yeast every time just taking it from one batch pitching it into another uh you know progressively then i'm definitely going to be adding yeast nutrients that include zinc because i want to make sure that that yeast is healthy so that makes sense to me also the comment about imperial i, I touched on it before I, I, that's what i think as well that they're probably using you talked about trace amounts of zinc being there for a five gallon batch the amount of liquid from a imperial yeast pouch that you're p- pitching into there, I would have to 
believe has probably the proper amount of zinc, uh, which on top of the tiny amount that the, uh, the grains contribute is probably more than enough. Just a guess on my part. I've never had issues that I would associate with low zinc. So I don't know, but, uh, next comment comes from Antonio B. Now Antonio B had a bunch of great comments on this article. He sounds like a, a, a yeast nutrient nerd, which I really appreciate. But for this one, he says, one thing I've noted from a post on pro brewer is that the level of zinc in the final wort is much less than what you add. Some brewers performed some measurements, uh, and they had to end up adding 0.4 to 0.5 PPM to achieve 0.2 PPM in the fermenter. Very interesting, possibly due to zinc being bound up with trube. So theoretically it could be that both beers were the same as the level of zinc in the final beer wasn't enough to be of any benefit. In the end, though, I still don't suspect it would have made a significant difference in brewers' ability uh, to taste the beers here, uh, which I think may be because fresh homebrew pitches of yeast have been pre-propagated with zinc compared to pro brewers who reuse yeast many times. Kind of touching on that same uh, concept. Yeah, yeah. This is another great comment, Antonio. Um, And yeah, uh, you know, binding up that zinc in the tube could certainly uh, be be an issue. Um, in this case, though, in my experiment, I didn't add it to the tube. I added it after it was racked and pitched the, ink dir- the zinc directly into the beer. Uh, but yeah, I could certainly see if somebody's adding it into the whirlpool or they're adding it in the boil. Uh, yeah, you would need to add enough that make sure that the right concentration of zinc is actually making it into the fermenter because that's where it's needed. So yeah, right. another really good comment. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Another comment comes from Larry Sayer. He says, your water profile appears to be tap water, which often contains sufficient zinc for yeast. Uh, Zinc additions are mainly considered to be of benefit to yeast uh, when one is building water from quality RO or distilled, uh, which are devoid of zinc. Uh, Do you know the zinc concentration of your source water, he asks? Ah, this was a really interesting comment and actually made me go back and look because I had to check and see if my uh, water report did contain zinc. Uh, it's not listed on my water district's uh, uh, water report. Um, it's not something that I test for. I use one of those brew lab water testing kits. Uh, so I, I, um, it, it's not something that you test for um, in those kits. Again, it's not listed on my water district report. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not there. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not required at least uh, to uh, report zinc, at least where I live, unless it's over a certain threshold. And I don't remember what that threshold is. But suffice it to say it was under that threshold. That threshold is still higher than what we would need for water. So it is possible that my tap water did have uh, zinc in it. Again, I didn't see it listed as a mineral in my water report, which is this kind of the best I can do without sending my water off and testing it specifically for zinc. But yeah, that's certainly something that could be. Um, If your tap water does have zinc, again, we just need a very small amount of it. You know, the the amount that's coming off of chains in the fermenter (laughs) is enough, (laughs) you know, or at least is purportedly enough for some German brewers. Yeah. Yeah, it could certainly be a, uh, uh, you know, an issue uh, if there's if if we if I got enough from just the tap water, mm-hmm. certainly a source for zinc. Yep, makes sense to me, Larry. Uh, good comment. So final final uh, uh, comment f- comes from Colin Kaminsky, who was the uh, used to brew at Downtown Joe's Brewery in Napa, California, and whose name you may recognize as uh, being co-author of the Water Book with John Palmer. He said, "In pro brewing, I noticed I noticed it took a few generations of cereal pitching to fully see the difference between adding and not adding zinc." You know, I'd be interested to hear Colin's thoughts on what those differences were, but uh, in- interesting observation at the very least. Yeah, I'd love to hear Colin's uh, Colin's comments on it. But yeah, that seems in line with uh, the the NBAA presentation that I, I heard about a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, what we've talked about in the podcast, it's, yeah, the cereal repitching whenever you've reduced that zinc amount that w- may have been provided by the manufacturer. If you're not adding it or you're not being uh, conscious about how much zinc is in your wort when it goes into the fermenter, yeah, your yeast may be suffering. Their sure. vitality may be lowered uh, because you're not paying attention to that. So, yeah, there's a pro, uh, you know, a, a pro boring purpose. Like I talked about with Blue Owl, we've done studies in our, um, in our brewery, uh, and have noticed that adding yeast nutrient, uh, does seem to produce consistent beers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's what we like and we like the taste of our beers that are coming out. So 
we'll probably continue doing it. Yeah, yeah, no reason not to. And and again, I hate this argument, but I but I feel like it's valid that there is a uh, potential, you know, matter of scale, right? That that on the pro brewing scale, it's going to have more of a of, of a noticeable impact uh, than it might on on the five or ten gallon home brewing scale. So there you have it. Uh, that does bring us to the end of yet another episode. A uh, really good chat about the impact uh, uh, zinc has in brewing. I, I thought it was interesting. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap things up, Cade? Yeah, no, I I enjoyed this chat quite a bit. I mean, I think there's still opportunity to explore this variable uh, in the future, and we'll see where we go from there. But yeah, if you're using zinc in brewing and making good beer, keep going at it. Yeah, right on, man. I couldn't agree more. And uh, like I mentioned before, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man.